Bonjour à tous. Alors, on va commencer tout de suite cette... Bonjour tout le monde. We're, uh, hello, we're going to start this new roundtable on the digitalization of uh, businesses, how to accelerate this digitalization. We saw during the pandemic those, the, the enterprises that were the most advanced and uh, that better resisted. It's a shift in uh, telework that was easier. Uh, but this digitization can also gives rise to problems also uh, in terms of financing, social issues changing of uh, activities of uh, work, uh, the work content, and with the pandemic, with the cyber attacks that we've been observing for several months, several years that uh, gain momentum. And we will talk about all these topics with our five panelists that I would like to introduce. There are six, I'm sorry. Sylvie Giano, you're the president and general manager of Alca. Thibault Loxad, you're the Director General of Jouve. Vincent Roux, you are the uh, CEO of Unatom. Andre Susten, you're the Minister of Entrepreneurship and Information Technologies of Estonia. And Felipe Trucho, you are Chief Technology Officer, Specialist of Cyber Security at PwC. And before starting the, the, our debate, I will hand over the floor to Augustin Patrick, who is a professor at HEC uh, com, uh, and member of the uh, Cercle des Economies, who will give us the big picture of the debate. I'll be very quick because we don't have much time. Thank you to the Circular Economist and everybody else for being here. I'm very pleased to participate in this panel. Of course, uh, digital has been at the heart of uh, people's experience of the uh, COVID. It's at every level of society in the households realized that they couldn't uh, do without uh, high quality devices. The big companies had to adapt and they had to make sure the uh, are there to invest to make sure that people could work in a secure manner from home. Another group who benefited a great deal was all of the companies who were well equipped, especially those in the digital sector. They have come out of the uh, crisis with a higher evaluation than the rest of the economy. The economy has really been transformed by this crisis. To uh, give a framework uh, for the debate, we have to look at uh, microeconomic aspects, how people have been through the transition. We have a lot of speakers who have concrete experience of this. When you buy up a startup, how do you integrate it? How do, what do you do when you have employees who are not happy using uh, digital tools, for example? Also, the hierarchical uh, aspects. How do you uh, redefine hierarchy in a di digital uh, world? Also, in uh, there's a difference between small companies, big companies, and the government. Uh, so there's a micro aspect. There's a macro aspect about the role of the state. The state has to think about all of the systemic risks that come together with this uh, transition. Of course, with the increase of inequalities, there are jobs that are disappearing. Part of the population finds itself uh, 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 unsuitable for uh, the digital world. There's also the cyber risk, which is growing. It's perfectly possible that in five years we may have a meeting on X on that theme because we've just been through a major cyber crisis in five years' time. And it's a theme of education and training where the state has an important role to play as well. I'll hand over to our panelists now to set the scene on these different subjects. Thank you. Thank you, Augusta. We'll hand over straight away now to two transitions. We have two transitions, a digital transition and an ecological transition. How can these two come together? You're a specialist in energy. How do you do that? Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you in this roundtable. You might wonder why Dalkia is uh, participating on a, in a roundtable on digital. Dalkia is, uh, is uh, the uh, digital services part of EDF. We are helping the world move towards a low carbon world. We want to remove carbon from the heating and lighting networks in a renewable way. And we're also working on energy savings and energy efficiency of buildings, whether they're industrial buildings or tertiary buildings or hospitals. And you're quite right. It's true that the crisis has made us aware of the need to accelerate these two transitions, the energy transition. We had a debate earlier about this. Is energy transition going to be forgotten in, the, forgotten in the recovery plans? Not at all. If you look at the extreme temperatures in Canada, uh, in 20 Canada, we've had these extreme events. And this year, 2020, has been the hottest on record uh, on a worldwide level. Then we have the look, we look at the digital transition. 
in a few days in companies for everybody who's, who had a job that allowed this to take place, they started working from home or in, within a few days. We'll have the Google and Microsoft suites on our computers. We had that in the companies. But the actually rate of use of these tools wasn't very high. And all of a sudden, from one day to the next, everybody started to use all these different suites, these computer software systems. And it was a complete revolution and transformation in the way people were working all of a sudden. Very striking. As somebody involved in the energy sector, I think it's a very good thing because this energy, this digital transformation can also help to uh, carry out the ecological transition. Why? Because the energy transition doesn't mean you just change from one energy to another, you get rid of oil and use something else, it's greener. No, not at all. You're moving towards something much more complicated. You're, we are creating ecosystems which are multifaceted with uh, smart grids and smart energy. Let me give you an example from Dalkia, my company. We're building a heating network in Heathwark which is a, a village in the massive Trantal. 90% of energy is recoverable, and uh, we get the heat from the Constellium site, which is a um, steel-making plant. They make steel. We get the heat from the factory, and we inject the heat into the uh, housing for the heating. We also use biomass heating. With biomass, we only use waste wood. People often say a lot of things about biomass that is inaccurate. We use uh, waste wood. Uh, for heating of the housing, and they, uh, this covers 90% of the heating needs without any production of CO2. At Nanterre, another example of an ecosystem, we have an eco neighborhood in Nanterre as part of the EDF group working with BIG. We are generating electricity using photovoltaic panels. We get uh, calories from geothermal systems. And we uh, uh, provide heating and electricity using COLSA. We also have heating systems, we recover heating from air conditioning system. These are complicated systems. You need to have digital systems to control them, manage them, and optimize them. And the second important subject in the, the energy transition, because apart from the energy production systems, we have to look at consumption as well. And this is concerns the recovery of data. We're talking about uh, security and responsibility for managing this data. When you recover data in phenomenal quantities of data, you can then improve energy savings and energy optimization. We've developed a service for industry called Delkia Aliti. We worked with Metro. We work, we've talked about the role of startups in this transformation. We'll work with Metron, which is a startup. On industrial sites, we get the, we find the correlations that are not non-intuitive. Intuitive means uh, when you're not at home, uh, you turn off all the lights. But there are other things much more complicated in industrial sites. Thanks to artificial intelligence, we can see what is creating consumption, and we deal with that. It's quite wonderful. We also do that with another digital startup. This brings me to another point. We talk a lot about greening and IT for greening. We have to talk about green IT as well. Often people say, Sylvie has studied uh, digital, for, uh, but IT uh, centers create consume a lot of energy as well. Data centers create uh, consume a lot of energy. So we, our aim is to have uh, be for these data centers to be carbon neutral. We're going to cool data centers in the original way using seawater in the south. We're going to recover heat, recover heat from these uh, data centers. And then let me give an example of a, a startup called Tresorio in Metz. They, they build small data centers. They're put in a room that uh, is in the hospital, and we put a water system around the data center. We heat the water, and that hot water is then used by the patients in the hospital. So you can use, you can have sustainable IT. There's also a recycling of computers. You can have more sustainable websites. A lot of people say dark is green. You have to be look at the number of photons, uh, number of photos and videos on pages. Dark is green is too easy to say. It's not that simple. Finally, to talk about this uh, digital transformation, this energy transition it can, is a huge internal transformation and also a big transformation from our customers as well. These are tools, and behind these tools are men and women. These tools have to be fully understood so that people can use them properly. The, the professions in our company have been transformed as well. When we put up 
platforms of uh, connected objects uh, in our platform. The Dalkia engineers who are experts in, in technique and uh, maintenance, they have to be able to uh, help uh, people use these systems. That's a very important aspect for us, which uh, means we have to take into account the people who work in our company. I have lots of things to say. I was very quick. Thank you, Sylvie. Thibault Langsad, Sylvie talked about uh, uh, digital transition and ecological transition. These are the two legs of the French uh, recovery plan and the European recovery plan. What is the role of the state in this digital transition? How can the state accelerate the digital transition of uh, enterprises? I think that the state can work in three areas. The first is to uh, take a strategic approach. The second is to provide support. And the third area is the finance, which is a key part. The first point is to uh, take a strategic view. And uh, we can see this in the recovery plan in France, which is quite eclectic and diffu diffuse. This has to be done in a coherent way. The companies for several years have started work their digital and digital transition and have uh, experienced a few problems in France. We had the year 2000 bug. We had difficulties when we changed to the euro. We were, had difficulties when we had to change the um, system for bank, banking transfers as well. And then for we changed the tax uh, deduction system in France as well. That we were afraid that companies would find it difficult, but it went very well. It's just to say that there's been an acceleration, an improvement in that way. When I say the state has to be uh, take a strategic approach, you need to uh, ask questions about the sovereignty of the approach, whether it's concerning search engines or the infrastructures you have. And there probably what was missing was a strategic vision to support all of these companies. There was a promise made which needs to be adapted, which is to say that the state is there as a guarantor of a meta platform, not a mega platform, but a meta platform. A meta platform is something where the state has to guarantee rules so that all of the companies can position their offerings and their solutions, whether it's at a national, local or territorial level. This will make it possible to have a huge library of solutions offering digitalization to companies and to citizens. And we have to say that today the state is once more taking an approach of developing mega projects and mega platforms and is working with the uh, different uh, partners and is uh, centering everything around these great, these major uh, players and stakeholders, which doesn't irrigate the digital system enough. The second point is training and support for the different professions. And today in France, we have real difficulties in that area. Though we don't have enough uh, IT engineers. We don't have enough uh, managers to support, uh, providing support in these uh, digital areas. The problem is that this slows down the transition and we can see Reindustrialization of services in other countries where this uh, transition is much smoother. For example, in India, where major groups have done this, we'll also talk perhaps about Europe, in, where in other countries they've been able to manage this transition more smoothly as well. On the employment policy and in training, there really is a uh, big effort that needs to be made quickly to support companies. If you need somebody to uh, manage your website for you, to be able to develop it, and to be able to put the applications in place. There are plenty of uh, uh, companies that can do that. But internally, it's also we have people who aren't participating enough in developing these actions. And uh, the last point is finance. And what we, and this is a normative part, concerning finance, I'm very pleased to see that we are different from other European countries. We have 17 unicorns. This is a, we're very proud of this nationally. That's not everything. We can't hide behind the fact that we have these 17 unicorns. Faced, faced with the gaffers and uh, others who have uh, much more powerful. So the financing system also has to be revised so that all of the support networks can receive better service and the investment bank which is very selective which is a positive thing can also broaden its scope so that this digital transition can apply to all kinds of companies 
and not just to startups which have the potential of a unicorn. We've seen that uh, during, this, uh, during the COVID crisis. There's been an amazing progress, especially by shopkeepers and small uh, stakeholders who have uh, become digitized very, very quickly in terms of the understanding and also because it's a development opportunity. And very quickly, the state realized there were plenty of systems that didn't exist and needed to be created in order to help them. And the last point concerns the recovery plan. 100 billion is a huge amount. We can ask uh, questions about whether the state, in this rather schizophrenic way, is going to put in place these 100 billions. Maybe it should have the capacity. It might be too prudent or too careful in uh, allocating these uh, billion, this billion, these billions, and uh, getting access to the markets because you respond to calls for tenders and you're working in a structured market. This can be a barrier to uh, normalization of the enterprises. Thank you, Thibault. There's one point you mentioned. It's a question of training and education, which is a difficulty which accentuates the digital divide. This is one of the essential points that you've observed, uh, François Weiss, Vincent Weiss, in your business. Is there something you've seen as well? Or is it a trend that's becoming more accentuated or not? Yes. Uh, TB has already talked about digital transformation and all the benefits you can uh, reap from that. What we say about COVID is that it has accelerated the transformation of the digital tsunami that has had a huge impact. And one major risk is this digital divide, which uh, everybody uh, knows this can affect uh, companies with uberization of companies. A lot of the key accounts have already worked on this. This is a main a big problem for us. And when you're talking about understanding these issues, this digital divide will be a major uh, issue uh, when you need to understand the security problems and the transformation of business models, not just of digitalizing and uh, making society more efficient. The second major point is the uh, population groups that I think there's a major risk of uh, declassification of uh, population groups. The role of the state is important there. Training and education and uh, in-service training is very important as well. In the initial training and education, which is the basis on which you capitalize your career, is something that is no longer the case. You have to have a continuous lifelong training over a long period, not just for three or four days. With an awareness raising, you have to support people. You have to help them understand so that they can uh, better understanding of technological tools so that they can use them every day to really transform society. There, there's a real risk in societies, uh, in companies, and uh, for citizens that there will be a declassification uh, where they will be uh, certain professions will be uh, uh, made less effective because the people don't have access to uh, the digital tools. The third point is the role of the state. We talk a lot about confidence. I think that confidence can't be imposed. It's based on education, first of all, and understanding of the issues and the consequences and of the technological innovations on everyday life and on the business models of companies is very important to create confidence. And the other important point is that people have to adhere to these models. And there's also a question of regulation, which can be a factor to accelerate or to create barriers. And the state has a major role to play apart from financing and support. The last point I want to emphasize is the state also has a role to create European champions, not national champions. We have to talk about European champions with a, a similar size to the US. We also need to protect. When you look at the major industrial success stories, these were companies that were protected by measures that enable them to grow and develop on a European and a worldwide level. That's an important subject, uh, in my opinion. We have a lot of destruction of value because of the lack of protection with, expo with exposure to worldwide uh, competition, which can be a, a real handicap for certain companies. We have to find the right level so that we can protect and favor uh, technological development. Concerning this question of uh, regulation, is it important? Yes, we're very delighted to have you with us, uh, Andres Sout. You are going to talk to us and tell us how you 
have found solutions in your country. We've uh, read and heard a lot about uh, this uh, Estonian miracle with the I state, this E state. How does the state uh, provide support? How does it make sure its companies are are at the leading edge of technology? Do you have advice, perhaps, to deal with these problems we've mentioned with the schizophrenia of the state that we talked about just now? I will speak in English uh, because my French is really too limited for uh, for speaking from a stage. But I think what is really important uh, when I talk about digitalization, it has to go along with our goals on the climate, which were just discussed, but also broadly in, on innovation. If we want in Europe to be globally competitive vis-à-vis -vis China, vis-à-vis uh, -vis US, we need to make all three things to happen. Green transition, digitalization, and innovation drive. Uh, I'm happy and proud to say that in Estonia we have seven unicorns and I hope to see more in not too distant future. And for that I think this is one point what the state can do. It can build enabling ecosystem, which is a legal framework that has been a really important part of the story. Uh, we have developed uh, the, the system where 99% of uh, public services are available online. And this was really a huge benefit uh, during the, the COVID crisis, but more broadly. It has been a journey. It has enabled us to become competitive, uh, to stay at the edge, on a competitive edge, and, and really to encompass on, on, on the new technologies. Uh, the second related matter is the education. Uh, already people mentioned here in the panel, uh, the digital gap or divide is, is an important topic and it's also present in Estonia. I can't say that there is no digital gap in Estonia. There are probably 10 to 15 percent of people who for a reason or another don't feel uh, at friendly terms with, with the uh, digital domain. And you, we will never get to 100 but we need to make sure that everybody who is willing, able, uh, we need to help and that really needs to start from a kindergarten. Educating, training, and then continuing until until you enjoy your uh, later years in uh, in your in your lifespan. I think digitalization in itself is is a great enabler. We shouldn't be afraid, uh, and of course, at the level of state, we really need to promote and support. Uh, as I said, uh, the legal framework is really important because uh, that is basically what defines uh, technology is never a barrier. I mean, there are innovative people, uh, they, they can always find solutions, but you need to make it like legally possible. And uh, we discussed earlier, there is also what is really, really important is, is, is trust. You need to make sure that your people, your citizens trust the system. And for example, in Estonia, whenever anybody access my record in health uh, domain or where do I live, uh, uh, what's my income state and statement? There is always a footprint. Nobody can never access my data without leaving his or her footprint. And I can always see, well, okay, municipality officer has checked my residential address because he or she wanted to be sure that I'm eligible for benefits. But there is always a footprint and I own the data. That is really, really critical and important. And you need to be transparent if something goes wrong. So when you need to explain, say, and, and there are things going wrong also in the uh, in analog world. I mean, you can always uh, have a paper file somewhere uh, in, uh, in a not proper place. Uh, so trust and transparency, I think, are really key. And then for a state to be enabler in, in creating the ecosystem. My last point is about uh, cybersecurity. If we look at the amounts of money which are going to be invested in digitalization, uh, only from the EU budget it will be 130 billion over coming years. If we top it up with the private money what is going to be invested, then globally we are going to see trillions of euros invested in digitalization over the next uh, five or so years. The flip side of the coin is we don't have a proper agreement or a benchmark. What is the right percentage of expenditure devoted to cybersecurity? Because if we look on the extent, sophistication, 
uh, this, uh, the breadth of cyber attacks. You take a colonial pipeline, you take the hospitals, you take municipalities, you take private email addresses of Polish politicians, uh, uh, and the list goes on. So this is profitable business for criminals. And for us, uh, investing in cybersecurity, making it resilient, our systems, both in governments and in private sector, is really the key. And for that, like we have a benchmark in NATO for defense expenditures, 2% of GDP, we need comparable benchmark for a best practice also in cybersecurity, a percentage of IT investment devoted to cybersecurity. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, transition to cybersecurity with the colossal amounts that have to be invested today. This is the uh, other side of the transition. Is this, this risk taken into account in companies? It is taken into account, but we can't talk about companies in general, we talk about this subject especially in digitalization of uh, companies. As we've already said, they already invest uh, massively in digital. It's very different in uh, uh, mid-cap companies. What's uh, struck me is that France is the leading d tourist destination in the world. 70% of the museums in France which don't have a website. So you can't go there. Tourists start by looking at the website, first of all, if they want to go somewhere. That's the importance of digitalization of small companies. We uh, said that we'd meet up in five years to talk about a major cyber crisis. We hope it won't happen. In five years' time, there's something that will have fundamentally changed, which is our investment in technology. We get the impression we've done a lot already because of the combined effect of 5G and uh, AI. We'll have doubled technology investment, with five, mil, five trillion, and we'll be up to uh, 10 trillion in five years' time. To answer what you said, the right figure is about 15% of a digital project has to be devoted to cybersecurity. This is a major challenge for France. I went, as you know, France is, has many engineering schools, very prestigious schools associated with the defense sector. We have international champions in France. If we stop reasoning in a very narrow French way, and if we're able to project ourselves at least into Europe, I think within five years' time, we have an opportunity to say if France is able to make the right choices in cybersecurity, we won't be good in every subject of cybersecurity, but in certain segments, we can become a world-class champion. There are many other advantages. We're not an offensive country in terms of cybersecurity. We have diplomacy, which is a moderator or a facilitator. We have a good image as French engineers around the world. Everybody loves them. And in fact, a lot of French engineers leave the country. I think the major factor in France is trust. As Alain Perfet said in his book, when you talk about technology, it's a huge paradox. In France, we're the world champions of the level of equipment in, of digital devices uh, in terms of smartphones. I have 140% of coverage in, of, in, for smartphones in France. What we show, it's the last thing that people touch. People keep subscribing to these services. We're ready for it, but we have a deficit in trust. People have lost trust. If you're a boss of uh, mid-cap, you'll read in the articles that uh, there are too many uh, uh, taxis using the wrong technology. And uh, at WPC, we do a study every day. We, we study 350,000 uh, uh, citizens called Hope and Fears, this report. 40% of the employees consider that in five years' time, technology will have made their job completely obsolete. I don't think it, this is true, of course, but it has been mentioned a great deal. This is probably a collective responsibility that we all have, and we could perhaps involve the state in this. All, I'm not sure the state and the technology go very well together. It often hasn't been very successful in France. We said it was a do I'm, I can say what I like. Um, this is an open debate. We talk a lot about uh, societal uh, responsibility. One responsibility is to support people through this uh, transformation by uh, upgrading and upskilling people. What's been very clear in this debate so far is that in the middle and lower classes, this is where the situation is going to be the most difficult. And there are limits as well. I won't talk about trust anymore. 
I saw another interesting study that for people in my generation, artificial intelligence is very negative. It's like a 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, where the machine takes control of everything, does what it likes. So that's the level of trust we have. I think this is the. I think trust seems to be at the heart of our subject of digital transformation. I would like to hear what you have to say when you talk about this question of trust and transparency. What is it? How do you react to this? Isn't this the crux of the problem? And this is isn't this what we have to do, sort out to be able to move on to this transition? Who would like to talk about trust? Within companies, this uh, affects many things. When a light uh, arrives in the field, if uh, the solution hasn't been built with people in the field, we have 10,000 technicians working for us at Dalkia. If the solution hasn't been built with the people in the field, there is a fear. Apart from the fact there is geolocalization, etc., people have to trust a tool. How do I use it? How is it going to change my, my job? How do I work with it? And this sets up different ways of orchestrating these very these different digital aspects in a particular way. Today we've reached a certain level of maturity. We talk about agility a lot. We have to put the users at the heart of the, these devices and systems so that they trust and have confidence in what they're doing. Uh, internally, I can tell you this is what we're doing, uh, and with this with our customers as well, uh, especially with geolocalization as well. I won't say any more. I'll let my colleagues say something as well. Yes, very, very quickly, I'd like to go back to the uh, issue I was mentioning earlier, where the state is setting up a 100 billion uh, recovery plan. It will be difficult to obtain these markets because there will be lots of calls for tenders and uh, tendering happening. There might be a lack of trust because of the out of the 100 billion, which is a huge market, we have to uh, put in place sub prefects for recovery to uh, make the access to this plan easier. We're creating more bureaucracy. The state is great, but it's going to be complicated. We're adding another level of complication with these sub prefects uh, dealing with the recovery plan. So that creates a lack of trust. It would be unthinkable in the US. We always compare ourselves to other countries. If you look at what's happening in the US, the capacity to, to access the market is governed by completely different rules. It makes it possible to go much further. I won't to self-promote my own company. We had a major contract in the US. We, a, we were able to win, impossible to win it, to gain it in France because the contract was too important. The state and the rules would have put us in a situation where we would have been economically dependent on a single customer. So we have an approach where the state wants to help, but the administrative machine is really not uh, fit for the, for the work. In parallel to that, you have another point, which is more concerns Europe more, which is an interesting tool, which is data protection and the uh, RGPD. We might say we can be part of this. We're going to protect you and your data, your personal data, but we are creating our own walls. Whereas the GAFA and the other major IT players have gone so far. First of all, we will never be able to catch up with them unless we uh, have a European sovereignty. But we're building our own rules, which are going to be a barrier to our own <laughs> digital transformation. I'm thinking of the healthcare sector, for example. In our hospitals, we have incredible healthcare data. All of the countries around the world are envious about this data, which is sleeping, um, which represents kilometers of patient files. I think it represents 200 kilometers of patient files. Our capacity to uh, scan and uh, digitize them and understand this history would lead to unbelievable diagnosis potential. And, and instead of that, no, we can use Chinese algorithms, algorithms, because we're going to have barriers because of the RGBD and the uh, data protection laws. So this is a paradox. We have the standard. We have huge potential, but uh, the rules can be a barrier to digital transition as well sometimes. Two comments. Well, first of all, that was said that France has a very excellent, excellent uh, engineering training level, but uh, it's a handicap also because when we talk about technology, you talk about algorithms, and not everybody has done engineering school. You don't talk about use cases. Use the transition of these uh, technological innovations in apps, in applications that will speak to people and transform business models. That's an important topic. 
And the second point of the state, and well, I think the state has initiatives to promote things and everything, but we don't have a business-friendly approach. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking with uh, on cyber secu security w with Israelis, and uh, uh, he was explaining to me how the Israeli army favors with six-year contracts, 2% of the best of the engineering schools. They have six-year contracts, and they will create pr uh, platforms on cyber security. And then after that, they leave and they make a fortune. Everybody's happy. And today we explain that we will draw profit uh, of what we managed to do or the and the, uh, the mining we did, we're in a conflict of interest with people who are deeply opposed. Uh, and so it's a real handicap for, uh, for the development of startups and uh, other topics. These uh, uh, Franco-French uh, reflections, what do, what, do you, what do you feel about that? How did you solve this issue of confidence and trust? As I said, it, it has been a journey. It didn't happen uh, overnight, uh, and we had at the time an advantage what, that we had a clean sheet. So we, we, we had an opportunity to start from really building from scratch, which we don't have any longer today. We have also 20 plus years of a legacy. But I think what still uh, matters in, uh, in, in this point of a trust, and if you want to really succeed, there are two things. Uh, you, need to do both, uh, you need to digitalize both the private and government services. Because otherwise, if you do only one, you will most likely stop in, uh, in, in, in a halfway. And then, in order to digitalize and be successful, they need to be user-friendly, which is not oftentimes fought in, uh, maybe in government circles, but, but you, need to, uh, you need to put really the sort of a client into the center. And then you can, uh, the more people start using the services, I think you can also, you will also gradually increase the trust, and I think the trust is really critical. For example, if we talk about elections, we can e-vote in Estonia, which is sort of the, probably the farthest you can go in democracy. But for me, it's a huge enabler and the strengthener of a democracy because you can get more people to vote, and this is what you eventually want. Nobody is going to stay away because it's raining or uh, I'm lazy to come, but you can do it from, from your home. So I think it's a process gradually building the trust and many people say, yes, GDPR is a problem, but we, we need to find ways around it in a positive sense that we, uh, we, we can still work with it. I mean, if you look at the big uh, global companies, they have all adapted and they can still uh, do business. So we, we shouldn't really be I think we, we should uh, rather focusing on, on how we can do something rather than, okay, we have this obstacle, we have that obstacle. That is, I think, just a mindset question also in, uh, in, in changing the, uh, the patterns and, and, and building the, the trust in people. Sylvie Jeannot, vous vouliez réagir. Juste en une phrase aussi. Yes, in a short sentence. We've treated this issue of trust. It's, there's a competitive advantage. Our customers want to be reassured on the fact that the tools that we have are talked about complex ecosystems, for example, the uh, data processing, uh, client data processing, if we can demonstrate that we were working a rationale of security, it's a, a big competitive advantage. And this is something we watch very closely and which we invest to be the best on the market. Yes, I'd like to react on that because uh, trust or confidence is uh, also a, a factor of, of attractiveness for our regions. I visited a customer here in the south, I won't mention the, the city. We have to make these territories attractive and maybe it goes through the role of the state. Uh, but uh, it's also to retain our own engineers on these territories. Uh, this is great. Uh, Post-COVID, COVID, you know, people want to leave Paris. They want to leave the big metropolises. But there's an opportunity. But this trust can only be accelerated if we create ecosystems that are favorable. What strikes me is that if you take agriculture, it's probably uh, one of the sectors that is the most technological, but it's always been dri dri driven by uh, evolutions and organizing cooperatives. So the sectors that we develop in agriculture, if we want to accelerate the digitalization of uh, our, our society, uh, you have to group up. Uh, uh, people will not be able to defend themselves against cyber attacks. So uh, it, it can be related to a given uh, business or a client database, but it's, I think it's essential. And I think we have an, a unique opportunity to, 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 to move forward.
there's a po point we developed at the beginning on training and the divide, uh, the digital divide. Uh, how do companies and states, how can they work on this issue of the, the digital divide it, so that they don't leave part of uh, our citizens on the side of the road, uh, of the digital road? So it's uh, um, one of the major uh, risks social risks that uh, threatens us. Well, if I may, uh, the state, I don't know what the state is <laughs> really, but in France, we have uh, another so topic is that this training should also go through with the politicians or elected representatives. I'll give you two anecdotes. Well, there's a first uh, prime minister who came to the, uh, the news, uh, the, the, the evening news, and uh, he talked about Uber and another one wrote, uh, a nice article on, on saying that he will stop. He would stop the social networks. And more seriously speaking, if you look at the U.S. or China, it's extremely constant. There's a very strate highly strategic vision of technology and cybersecurity. And I think in France we need, because the state is here, is represented here. But in the political instances, we need to have a political staff that has a better intimacy and knowledge of technology. I don't know how you uh, speed up in real time uh, this uh, employability capacity to better train. Uh, I think it's a, a bit complex in the National Education Board to make uh, the cycles efficient. And if it's efficient, well, it's already uh, uh, to be changed. Uh, it needs to be updated. The COVID crisis will probably uh, open considerably the labor market and there where we recruited on employment basins or in several departments in France, for example, while the remote or telework will remove our guilt. Uh, you can work in from France and Romania or other countries. Uh, on the condition that you speak the language, where English is so widespread in this IT uh, domain, and this will enable to have a, a much broader offer for uh, businesses and within the scope of their uh, digitization. Some countries that stood out who had that resource, which had that resource. But now, the more we make progress, the more tension we will have, and the businesses will probably turn to uh, countries which are attractive capable of uh, developing solutions and bring skills in uh, remote work or what have you, which wasn't the case today. You wanted to react, yes, the phenomenon that is present, yes, uh, we see that uh, large corporations are uh, sourcing internationally. Uh, we talked about India, but there's a risk of declassification if we don't train our own collaborators and the whole of the population because we will um, seek competencies uh, elsewhere and savings also because it's cheaper. Uh, it's a new form of delocalization and it makes uh, uh, the work contract more uh, precarious. Uh, it's a real topic for the government to face this kind of thing. It was mentioned this morning, I don't know in which uh, uh, event, but uh, with the uh, constraints in Europe uh, um, th that make uh, uh, things difficult. But there's a real risk of a di digital divide uh, and uberization of the labor contract, the work contract, with social con consequences. Um, if we don't take good care of the, uh, ensuring uh, the training to competencies and everything. Uh, Andres Sout, yes. Two or three examples uh, of uh, private and public uh, cooperation in Estonia in the field of educating and training the people, which have been really private-led initiatives. One of them is a unicorn squad, which is uh, meant for young girls to be interested and acquainted with the IT uh, skills and to, to develop and maybe grow the young entrepreneurs. Uh, which was also a like, purely private initiative uh, founded by, by some people who have been successful in IT uh, business. And the second one is, is a coding school which was founded in, um, uh, in, in the area or in the region what used to be uh, uh, producing energy from fossil fuels, uh, which is meant for people for all ages. Uh, founded by founders of a uh, couple of uh, unicorns. I think these type of things, we need to compete for a talent anyway, globally, also for engineers uh, and our professions. So we need to, to see really, to make this 
uh, private-public partnerships available. And the third, third example is we sponsored from the ministry uh, part of um, uh, studies in engineering of uh, um, high school and or a university and uh, and one of the leading uh, companies in technology companies in Estonia. So where they had a really really high competition for uh, one slot uh, at the university. So there is an interest. You need to offer young people the right product in the right way, and and you will attract and retain the talent. Thank you. Philippe Trochot. Philippe Trochot. On attractiveness. On attractiveness. Well, there's a topic that we did not cover. That was diversity in technology. Diversity in technology. To give you on cybersecurity, there are very specific uh, statistics in the U.S. showing that uh, 500,000, there are 500,000 jobs that aren't filled in cybersecurity. The European Commission uh, in Europe, they say we'll be lacking uh, 3 million people in the world by 2026 to s serve jobs in cybersecurity. So it's, probably, it's an issue for large French corporations. A lot of uh, companies where the organizations in cybersecurity are staffed at 50 percent because you don't find the, the competence. And it's unfortunate because we're a territory where we have a lot of engineering schools on cybersecurity in the mathematic code. Uh, it came back. Uh, it, it's now the, the, the leader in the world, so we have all the qualities in France, and so we need to be able to attract new talents, and notably women in technologies and engineering schools. You're at 4 or 5 percent of women, and it's unfortunate. We have a partnership with one of those schools, and the director general explained that, in fact, he took the problem at the source. He went in the high schools, explained the technology uh, employs uh, employment, and he went from 5 to 25 percent in a few years. Uh, all of us half of us. Uh, we have That's our slogan. And that's uh, very important for technology, not only on the politically correct side. We, again, we need more resources. And when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk about technology, but we have behavioral problems in cybersecurity. There's a lot of uh, men and they're uh, fighters, they're warriors. Uh, they go to war when they work. Uh, uh, but we need more, better governance, uh, more risk management, more talents. And I think yeah, the feminization of this function is essential. I see people noting in the in the audience that men are warriors in cybersecurity, and they have uh, beliefs. I'll give you an anecdote, uh, share an anecdote with you if you have time. I take care. I had people come in my office. They said uh, the malware. You know, they said, "Oh, this one's better. This is this one's uh, so." So they're really worried. So if we need uh, r to be rational in cybersecurity, we need to listen. I didn't want to make that pledge today. You gave me the opportunity, but there's a lot to do for techno technology digitalization uh, to attract new talents. Uh, so women are the future of cybersecurity. Thank you for your synthesis. In a nutshell. So two comments. So one comment on the education side. I think we go. Uh, we have to go back to the basics. The, the, the basis. The uh, mathematics in France is a real topic. Uh, uh, the growth of India, for example, on uh, uh, the digital sector comes from the training in mathematics, education in mathematics. And here in France, we have very bad indicators on that. Rather than training in people on on the digital domain, let's raise the level in mathematics and in math. Uh, it's a key issue. It does not be complicated. I think we have to go back to the roots. So more math, more women. Okay, we got three, two. <laughs> Thibault? No, on more women, it's a, there's a real issue here with the IT populations. I think we have to solve this equation. On the profiles that take part in the digi digitization work, uh, coders, for example, uh, we have uh, in front of us uh, people who are, again, warriors <laughs> in their behavior. Uh, they're uh, very attached to the mission, to their mission. Uh, the wage salary will be in the third position, the capacity to work in uh, a, a, a company that has a global project. But wages, and uh, it's not the most important in the beginning. Uh, there's a tension there, so uh, the, 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 these people are hunted and they get the salary they want. So it's populations that are more precarious when it comes to employment. They, uh, they leave easily. They, there's a big tur turnover. There are populations that are hybridized, and uh, we, they would want answers. 
to be more stable and ensure the development of the enterprise. And the feminization is also a, an issue given the behavior of those populations. They're not less exemplary, but they uh, do not reflect the stability that women would look for in their career. And they're faced with uh, populations that are uh, warriors. So there will be methods to change. When you look at populations of engineers, uh, um, there's an unbalance. But when they arrive in enterprises, those women, they're few, and they're faced with uh, facing a population that is quite hybrid. That's another um, topic. And we don't have uh, many platforms in India, but we pay decades of degrading messages for computer sciences. You know, uh, people some years ago said, you know, coding is for the Indians, uh, full stop. Uh, but we're paying the bill for that. Uh, we're, uh, it's really a big work to, 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 be, to, to regain the, uh, the, the leadership uh, in the schools. But it's a message, a bad message that was conveyed. And now I think we have to review all this and go back to the basics again. I will have two things to say on what was just said. Debate on training. I think with all these competencies, uh, skills that are essential in the uh, digital departments, and there's also the skills and competencies of uh, the digital skills. Uh, uh, we think that uh, youth, uh, the fact of playing games uh, uh, and uh, going on social networks, they think they're good with computers. No, be careful. We have to train in real time everybody on the digital tools that are deployed. Uh, that's something I observe. We, they need to, 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 to understand that they're not specialists. It's not gaming that gives you this uh, competency. And I tell young ladies also that they should be attracted by those, uh, those, uh, those sectors. So we have about 10 minutes left for a Q&A session. So I'm sure. I imagine that there are questions from the floor. Yes, a hand is raised here, asking for a microphone. Hello, everybody. On the 17th of May, the Secretary of State to the digital sector uh, launched an initiative in, in the field of sovereignty for the cloud, for example. There are some private initiatives that were announced. I had a question on the sovereignty, on sovereignty. What the client need? What is the interest of sovereignty? And what limits do you uh, do you have? Uh, so, Mr. Sot, geopolitically, maybe you could uh, comment on this, given uh, when we think of the attacks that uh, Estonia suffered a few years ago. So, sovereignty, complicated topic. We're convinced that it's a need, it's a necessity to, 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 to generate uh, trust. If you go to very small enterprises and uh, industries, and and uh, uh, when you propose applications, uh, uh, there's a big question issue of trust. Uh, computer science is based on, on confidence, on trust. It's an essential element of so the capacity to develop for uh, each country a sovereign cloud or sovereign clouds that correspond to this environment. I think it's a need, it's a necessity for the public. And maybe this announcement will enable to make progress in that, uh, in that field. But there's, there are limits. Limit. Uh, the actors that are uh, targeted today, I'm not talking about those who will operate uh, locally, but those who will uh, provide the equipment are all Americans. So we can have the sovereignty uh, with the data, but you know, it depends on the, the, the dependency. Uh, so the government must uh, take control on a uh, subject, uh, on the topic of creating European champions to face the United States with their proper funding and financing. And there's the pension plans also, the uh, retirement plans. Who finances the US? It's the pension plans, it's the retirement plans. So if we don't have uh, the capacities there, we will always stay in the early stage in Europe uh, with a technological dependency. So th that's not a solution. There's a necessity in creating trust, but there's another real issue uh, for the future to be independent. Uh, yeah, I, I fully agree. I mean, the question about uh, cyber attacks, and Estonia was the first one, uh, the first sovereign really attacked by another sovereign uh, back in 2007. 
Uh, and indeed, there is very little what has changed in, the, uh, in terms of the nature of uh, some of these attacks. Uh, I mean, there was a recent report by, uh, by the US authorities about uh, several attacks linked to uh, special services uh, of, uh, of the Russian uh, intelligence uh, forces. So there is, uh, I mean, we are all tested every day not only Estonia and not only a government in Estonia or com companies in Estonia, I think everybody is tested. Every, uh, and that's why uh, in awareness and investment in cyber security is, is really critical because if we don't do it hand in hand in digitalizing the entire economy, we will make ourselves just more vulnerable. And that is a wrong way to go. Uh, of course, business from business perspective, uh, it's not, and also from government uh, side, if, there, if you don't have a budget, you oftentimes tend to invest in, uh, in, uh, in business and less in, uh, in, in cyber security. But I think we re that's why I was also emphasizing that we need this clear uh, agreement and commitment at the level of governments and, and also in the businesses in a good practice, like, uh, like you mentioned, uh, Philip, in, in as a percentage of, uh, of uh, IT expenditure. On the sovereignty, uh, Partly because of uh, attacks what we faced back in 2007, we have also our own data embassy in Luxembourg, where everything is backed up uh, and, and which is like a proxy of, uh, of an ordinary embassy, but just in a digital uh, domain. So that is also something I think we need to collectively think how we can better protect and, and build the, the resilience. And of course, with a cloud, uh, I mean, it's, yeah, there is a question of, uh, uh, jurisdiction. Uh, so, but there are also solutions how to uh, to build this sort of a legal certainty uh, that, that the data what is here in Europe is actually governed by the European law. And I know that uh, your government has also been working on on some of the agreements, and we are also negotiating. So, but there are ways out. But I think we need to be aware, and our mindset needs to be open, uh, and we sh we shouldn't really back away from digitalizing because of all of these threats, because otherwise the rest of the world moves on anyway. So, we, And we need to be actually the leaders, not the followers in this process. Une autre question? Any other questions from the floor? Yes, right in the back, R microphone coming. Slowly but surely. A quick question because uh, time is flying. No worry, I'll be, I'll be brief. Jean Simon, I'm a lawyer and founder of Two Legal Tech. I defend the idea that law is a weapon, is a, a tool for enterprises. Uh, we covered this topic a bit, but I think that before anything, everything is a question of means, financial means, not only human means. You've addressed that, but it's also financial means. Estonia, you must know that the minimum wage is twice less than in France. The minimum wage. A uh, French engineer that you uh, will earn uh, twice or three, two times, uh, two and a half times that well, he will earn two times less than what he will earn in France. So uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the fact that talents leave is uh, unavoidable. I think that in businesses you have to lower social charges for everything that's tech and uh, cybersecurity. When you pay 50% of social charges, there, there has to be a, a, a write-off. Uh, on these charges. The people working there should have an exoneration. They should have a, a, a cut on the charges. What is your suggestion to keep, maintain talents in our country? Vast question, is in Two minutes. 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. I think the first ask, uh, point uh, is something quite conventional, but if we talk about a social harmonization at the le Euro level of Europe, we won't uh, achieve anything. There will always be more attractive countries. What I see is that in Eastern Europe, for example, the level of wages is increasing. I uh, bet that in Romania we'll have wage levels that in two or three years about the same as what we have in France. But the difference will be on social charges that weigh on companies. And France is not the country, I would say, that will be uh, ready to lower uh, those charges um, or contributions. Where there's a real issue is the social harmonization and tax and fiscal harmonization. Uh, you know the uh, in uh, the taxes in Estonia is uh, what level? I S. No, you want to say ta uh, 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 answer. Uh, but uh, in more serious terms, I think in IT and elsewhere, we are not really competing uh, in Estonia, and I think in general in Europe, 
for being cheap. That's not really the point. Uh, if we want to attract globally, and this is also what uh, applies in Estonia, you, you need to have more than just taxes. It's, it's the entire ecosystem of how easy it is to attract talent globally, to retain it, what's the education system, what's the healthcare system. Uh, and taxes, yes, are important. And uh, the big advantage in Estonia is that we have a really simple tax system. It's a 20% flat on income. Uh, it's uh, uh, for as long as you don't pay out dividends as a corporate, uh, the tax obligation is, is postponed until you pay out dividends. But the social tax is actually not that low. It, it's uh, 33%. So we are roughly percentage point or two above the OECD average. So we are not really a low tax country, but it's more of an ecosystem what, what really makes, makes the difference. And somehow you need to fund also the state, the future pensions and everything. So in Estonia, what I have been advocating is we need more investment, we need more capital, more new businesses, and then we can actually lower the tax rate, not, not to increase them. Merci à vous cinq. Donc on retiendra les... Thank you very much. Uh, there are the Amazons of the digital, the schizophrenia of the state. Uh, these are things that we mentioned that, that we are all tested when it comes to cybersecurity. Now, a sum up, Augustin. I will be very short, brief in a nutshell. I thank all my all the panelists. It was very clear. I don't want to do a summary, but find a tran transversal uh, topic. You know, the digital domain is a transversal topic. And this economic topic is the, the complementarity in economy. It's a key element of uh, modeling, complementarity between different elements. I think that with this uh, idea of uh, uh, the digital domain, there's the different ingredients must be there at the same time so that things work. Otherwise, it doesn't work. And this, uh, it's like the chicken and the hen, uh, the, the hen and the, the, the egg. You know, uh, women will say, I'm not going to go to an engineering school, 5% girls in the, in the school. But inversely, if it's the case, if you have more women, it, it will, we will reach a better balance. And so um, with the digital transition and the green transition, the idea is to know how you change the balance, how you end up finding a, the proper balance where all the ingredients have moved and place us in the right balance. And complementarity is the complementarity between public initiatives, private initiatives, uh, on the topic of training, funding, financing, the idea that the, the state has to work on the infrastructure and provide the legal conditions so that it's easy for entrepreneurs to take risks, that it's worth their while, uh, and of course the idea of infrastructure again. So this is the first major topic, complementary. It's a key concept in economy, and uh, there are good balances and bad unbalances, and we may be stuck on the wrong balance because the ingredients are there so it's the chicken the chicken the, the hen and the, the egg <laughs> and so the second topic that was raised is the systemic risk of being stuck in the in the imbalance and this we find in the cyber risk if you don't coordinate uh, to make it a major theme topic there's a risk that in a few years will be in the wrong balance but the right the, the idea like for the bug of the year 2000 it could be behind us in five years and there's the risk of poor execution of the state decisions and that is even if the the state is goodwill there's a risk that they don't really see the problem or identify the problem they want to develop champions and they don't select the right champion so, so it's good to be, always be there to reframe things when it's needed you know uh, to um, to help the state if need and the risk of being uh, behind and the risk on education. Everybody addressed that, uh, whether at the top level of uh, uh, the field medal or mathematics, uh, but there's a, the middle level is really low and it, this uh, generates a, a systemic risk for the country. That's the, the, the medium level students, you know, which, is, which are dropping out. So it's my conclusion, complementarity, systemic risk to always have in mind so don't, we don't end up in 10 years uh, with the COVID crisis on the, with the impression that we uh, wouldn't have done what we should have, should have 10 years before. Thank you very much to the six of you. Take good care.